We are in um, Acts, of course. If you've been with us, you know we've been in Acts for several months now. We're working through this book, this amazing book. We're going to be finishing it up here in, in probably just a couple weeks. Uh, we celebrate Christmas then, and then we will celebrate the new year, and then in January... We will be going through the book of Romans together. Um, last week when I shared that for the first time, there was actually a, a, a few of you, I heard some little like, whoos, you know, when, when we did the, we're going to the book of Romans. And that's why, you know, that makes me so happy because I, I love being a part of a church family who is excited to study the word of God together. Amen. Man, that's awesome. We, that, that's just that's such a beautiful thing that we love to get together. We love to open the Word of God, and we love to, to learn from it and, and see what God has for us. And so we're going to continue to do that this morning. Now, we're only going to be covering the first 11 verses of chapter 23 this morning. Uh, I intended on covering a whole lot more than that. It, if you've ever preached, if you've ever done this kind of work, you know that sometimes God just decides, you know what? You're not doing what you thought you were doing. And and that happens from time to time. I intended, my intent was to cover literally 23 and 24 today. I had a whole idea in my head. This is where we're going. God said, "Ah, nope, you're going to do the first 11 verses and that's it. And so that's what we're doing today. And I'll kind of explain more of it here in in a little bit as to why that is. Um, But if you weren't with us uh, the last, uh, last week anyway, we saw chapter 21 and chapter 22 together. We see Paul ends his third missionary journey. He makes it to Jerusalem, meets with the church leaders there, and he wasn't there very long before there was this massive riot because they had falsely accused Paul of basically being a traitor to the Jews. They they trumped up all these charges that just weren't untrue, said that he said things he didn't say, did things he didn't do, and so they got everybody in a big tizzy, and uh, there was a big riot that was going on, and matter of fact, it got so crazy, so bad, and there was so much fighting going on as they were literally trying to uh, beat Paul to the point where they were trying to kill him. The Roman guards have to step in because their job to keep the peace. They step in, and basically they, they do. They save Paul's life. They take him back to the barracks, and they're going to try to sort out what in the world is happening. Why is this guy, Paul, got everybody so fired up? Why is all this craziness happening uh, under their watch? They're not happy about it. And so what they decide they're going to do is we're just going to beat it out of them, right? They're going to go old school. We'll just beat you until you tell us what uh, this is really truly all about. Why are these people, why, why are you causing such a disturbance? But as they literally stretch Paul out um, to beat him, um, they realize that Paul kind of speaks up and says, I just want you to know something. By the way, I'm going to ask you a question here. This is my version. And, and he says, I'm a Roman citizen, you know, and so what you're about to do, you realize that you're not supposed to do this, right? I mean, he's, he's communicating with him like, you understand I'm a Roman citizen and you're about to beat a Roman citizen, which was illegal before he had a, a proper trial and was convicted. So uh, they, they hear that. They're freaking out about that a little bit. Uh, they don't know what to do because they could get in a ton of trouble if this gets back to Rome. And so the guard... The, the, the commander in charge especially is like, whoa, 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 time out. We're not doing that. And that's kind of how we ended last week. Now, I'm going to finish the last verse of chapter 22 because it kind of leads us into 23 uh, together. And this is what the last verse of, of chapter 22, verse 30, it says, the commander wanted to find out exactly why Paul was being accused by the Jews. He was going to beat him to try to figure it out. Now he's going to have, come up with a different plan. So the next day he released him. And then he ordered the chief priests and all the members of the Sanhedrin uh, to assemble. Then he brought Paul and had him stand before them. So they released Paul the next day. It's probably obviously only for a few hours or so. The commander gets the Sanhedrin all together. And then he says, okay, Paul, let's bring Paul back. Let's put him before them. Again, he doesn't understand. Remember, he's a Roman. He's a Gentile. He, he doesn't get this whole Jewish thing. Doesn't understand their laws. Doesn't understand what all the fuss is about. And so he's going to take Paul to some, a group that does have some power and does understand it all and so, see if they can sort this whole thing out. So this commander, we notice here, has the authority to ask this council to convene for what would have been a special meeting. This wasn't a normal time for them to meet. And we've covered this before, but a quick reminder, uh, a little refresher, the Sanhedrin is... It's made up of 70 men with the high priest, 
uh, who serves as kind of the chairman, so to speak. He was kind of like a chief justice, the one responsible for making it, <clears throat> making sure that any hearings are run properly and they're run legally. Uh, and you also need to remember that the Sanhedrin is made up of, of two sects of, uh, of Judaism, right? And so you have the Sadducees and you have the Pharisees. And that's what makes up these 70 members uh, of this, this Sanhedrin, this Jewish council. And so that understanding that there's these two groups is going to be important for our text this morning because Paul's actually going to play them uh, against each other in what is just, I think, a stroke of genius how he does this. Um, and we're going to see it here. Let's pick it up in, in chapter 23, <clears throat> starting with the first verse there. We're going to read just the first verse. I'll say a few things and then we'll continue on. Paul looks straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers... I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. So I stopped there because it looks, this is a little side note. Some of y'all like this stuff. Some of y'all are like, get to the other stuff. But here we go. Side note is because Paul refers to them to his, as his brothers, there's a lot of scholars that hear that, see that, and they're like, that means something. Because if he had not, because they believe, again, we're not 100% sure on this, but some scholars believe that before, obviously, Paul's conversion, that he was a part of the Sanhedrin. That's why he refers to them as his brothers and not my fathers or some other term here. Uh, and also they use Acts 26.10, which we'll get to eventually, where Paul says that he cast his vote. Um, they use all that as evidence that they believe Paul may have served as a Pharisee on the Jewish count, ruling council. So we don't know if that's for sure or not. It's a possibility. I just thought that I would mention that to you. It's interesting because of many other reasons, but we won't, that's not where we're headed this morning. Verse 2 of uh, Acts chapter 23. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. <laughs> Paul was not happy about that, right? Um, and that doesn't sound like, right? That doesn't sound very strong, right? We look at that, we're like, Paul, you could have maybe come up with a little bit better uh, something there. I don't know. And, but you need to understand, this is a massive insult in Paul's day, especially to the high priest. Because Paul's basically, when he's calling him a tomb, which again, the, what they meant when they said that in Paul's day was, you know what? You look great on the outside, but you are full of deceit and wickedness on the inside. Today, it, it's equivalent to calling somebody a hypocrite, um, Telling somebody they're just a, you know, they're two-faced, you know, fake person. You know, you, you, you act this way, but this is who you really are. I mean, he is, this is not, this is very strong language that Paul is using here. Even though today it doesn't sound as much like that. He's definitely calling him out. Definitely calling him a hypocrite. Um, and again, this is to the high priest. Let's continue. Paul continues. You sit there, this is Paul still, you sit there to judge me according to the law. Yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. Those who were standing near Paul said, how dare you insult God's high priest? Paul replied, brothers, I did not realize that he was the high priest. For it is written, do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. So a couple things are happening here. Paul calls them out for judging him for supposedly breaking the law. That's what, they're ju- that's what he's there for. Supposedly broke the law, even though he didn't. While they for sure break the law by hitting him before he's convicted of anything. So Paul's like, how can you guys live with yourselves? Really? You're, I'm standing here. You're trying to you know, accuse me of something I didn't even do and saying I broke the law when I didn't. You absolutely break the law by hitting me before I'm even convicted of anything. And so he's definitely calling them out. But then they call Paul out for insulting the high priest, which also is against scripture. And Paul knew that. And that's why he ends up apologizing, saying he didn't realize he was talking to the high priest. Now, the, it kind of begs the question, right? Like, how did Paul not realize that he was talking to the high priest? I mean, I think that's where my mind goes. Maybe that's where your mind goes. And we know Paul was a very educated man. We know he knows the Jewish law and the traditions. And so it shouldn't have been too difficult to pick out who the high priest was. I mean, that, that's kind of what runs through our brains. And so I did a little bit of digging here, a little bit, help some of us who think about this stuff. Um, Scholars give a few reasons, and maybe you would say, I like that one or that one or whatever it is, but um, the first one is that they believe that it's possible that Paul didn't recognize him due to poor eyesight from his injuries. We, if you've been with us, you know Paul has been had the full beat out of him multiple times. He's been left for dead multiple times, um, 
he, he, we know even from other scripture, we know from Galatians that he tells us his eyesight is awful. And so some scholars are like, maybe he couldn't see, maybe he, as well. Maybe he didn't really, wasn't able to see him. We, we don't know. That's one, one possibility. Uh, the second one is that the high priest was, was not acting like a high priest should act, right? I mean, he was clearly violating the law. So Paul, Paul could have been being a little sarcastic here. Right? I mean, if you just got hit in the mouth and you're standing, this Paul's been through a lot. You have to understand this moment in his life is a really, really low moment. He's struggling. And now he's come off of this other journey. He's done three journeys. He's just, he's again been beaten and beaten and beaten. And now he's being beaten uh, in front of these people without him being convicted. He's, I'm assuming, again, this is us, in our, we put ourselves in his place. He's ticked off. He just got punched in the mouth for no reason and very well could be that he was being sarcastic like oh you're the high priest didn't realize it since this is the way that you're acting so we don't know I mean was that what Paul did we're not so sure the third one is sort of like that one it's that maybe Paul was frustrated uh, by being hit in the face and just reacted before he thought it through so it could be that Paul just made a bad choice here he let his anger and frustration get the best of him I know none of us can relate to that right Um, but no matter the reason Paul does apologize for his words. He recognizes what he said wasn't good. It wasn't okay. It was against scripture. And so he apologizes for it. And now comes that moment I alluded to earlier of Paul being brilliant, just a genius for what he does here next. Verse six, then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, my brothers, I am a Pharisee descended from Pharisees. I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, and that there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees believe all these things. So again, in a stroke of genius, Paul pits these two sects against each other by bringing up something that they don't agree on. Um, Paul knows, he's very well aware that the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They don't believe in demons. They don't believe in angels. He also knows the Pharisees believe in all those things because he was a Pharisee himself. And so he says, listen, kind of plays to the Pharisee side a little bit. Listen, I'm a Pharisee. My daddy was a Pharisee. I come from a long line of Pharisees. And I'm here today because I have placed my hope in the resurrection of the dead. Now, Paul's obviously alluding to the resurrection of Jesus But this is going to start a huge fight between these two parties. Sadducees are yelling, there's no resurrection of the dead. Pharisees are yelling, yes, there is. And Paul, that that kind of sounded like Buddy the Elf, yes, there is. But that's kind of what's happening. And Paul is sitting back, in my mind, and and this is what he wanted. He's like, let's get the attention off of me. Let me bring this up. Let me remind you of this. And these two parties are going crazy. Let's continue. Verses 9 and 10. There was a great uproar, and some of the teachers of the law who were there, who were Pharisees, stood up and argued vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man, they said. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to them? Now they're, woo, now they're bringing that up in front of the Sadducees. The, the dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. So it works. Paul was standing on trial. He gets them sidetracked and arguing about all the things they disagree on instead of them being unified on what they do agree on. It kind of sounds like Congress, right? And they just start tearing each other apart. I mean, they are literally going at it. The, the Pharisees, if you notice here, they actually take Paul's side. They even bring spirits and angels into the conversation, which of course riles the Sadducees even more. Everyone just loses their minds. And this literally, this turns into more honestly of a WWE match than anything else. I mean, they're, it is, you understand, they're fighting. They're not just fighting with their words. I mean, this has gotten out of control to the point that the commander's like, we got to get him out of there because he's going to lose his Life And you can almost see the Roman command. At least I see it this way. The Roman commander standing maybe in the back watching this, just shaking his head like, are you kidding me? Is this what's going on? Like I, this dude, I'm just trying to figure out what this guy has done that's so bad, that's so wrong, that everybody hates him. And everywhere he goes, they, the riots happen and people want to kill him. And I bring him before this council thinking this is going to solve the problem. And they start acting like a bunch of children and fighting. And, and it's so bad that I've got to go, go get him. Go get because he's going, he's going to get killed here. And once again, we've got to save Paul's life because if we don't get in there, something bad's going to happen to him. So they go in. 
They take him out, and they're like, the commander's thinking, I've got to find a different plan. This plan isn't working. So they take Paul away. They get him back to the barracks safely. And the next night, something incredible happens. And this is in verse 11. Uh, again, uh, get there with Paul. This is a terrible, terrible time for him. He's been through so much. Um, and his future does not look very bright as far as his future here on earth. Uh, he's left all these people that he loved. You've been with us. You saw him say goodbye to so many of the people he loves more than anybody else and on earth. And, and now here he is. We, we, we know he's, he's probably pretty down. In verse 11, the following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. So this is where I was telling you I felt like God just kind of moved me in a different direction. And, and so I want to take some time on this verse and this situation. Because first of all, what happens here we need to understand is special. If you've read through Scripture, you understand that there's a lot of times in Scripture we see where God will send an angel. We also see where God will send another person, a prophet, or just someone else, another person to encourage one of his servants in times of trouble. God does that. He shows up and cre- there's other people he, he, he allows to show up in their lives all through Scripture, and even in our own lives at times, still to this day, to encourage us in the most difficult moments of our life. But this is a super rare moment when Jesus himself shows up and encourages Paul. And so, again, this kind of begs another question of why. Why why did Jesus do it this way, this time? Well, again, a lot of scholars believe it was because this is possibly one of the lowest moments in Paul's life. This This is maybe more, Paul's probably more down in this moment than he's maybe ever been in his life, which makes this encounter even more purposeful. And Paul Again, if you've been with us, you've seen what he's gone through. And if you haven't, go back and, and, and go through this series with us and pick it up maybe where we started picking up with Paul. And you see what this man has gone through, what he has sacrificed. Both, I mean, obviously physically is, is the, the big part of this. He has lost so much in his life due to the cause of Christ. And so, um, man, he's been through it. And we can't forget, this guy's human. I think sometimes we elevate Paul to the status of like Jesus. And, you know, and, and even though Jesus was human, he was also fully God. But Paul's a, he's just like you and me. He has no special powers other than what the Holy Spirit may put on him or give him. And he's been through all of this. But he's just like you and me. And the fact that Jesus shows up here just to encourage him, it, it tells us this is probably something Paul really needed. Again, This is something that I love about the Bible. It doesn't just include the big moments and the victories and all the successes. It records moments like this as well. It reminds me that it's normal for good, godly people to have bad days, to have difficult seasons, to feel sad or scared or frustrated or lonely or defeated. I love that about God's word. I preached a sermon many, many years ago now. It was titled, It's Okay to Not Be Okay, But It's Not Okay to Stay That Way. I didn't come up with the term or the phrase. I'd heard it, uh, that quote at a conference I'd attended, and man, it just stuck with me because of all of the moments or seasons uh, in life when we simply aren't okay. And it was like it was a release for me. It was like, wow, I really need to think this through because the truth is we all struggle, but for some reason, and especially as Christians, Many of us feel like we can't be not okay. I grew up in a church. I grew up my whole life in the church. And the world I grew up in, and maybe you can resonate with this as well, especially in the church, we have to have it all together. You have to look like you have it all together or you're going to look like you don't have Jesus in you. You're going to look like you don't trust Jesus. If you're ever not okay, that's not okay. And so you have to put on the face and you have to fake it and you have to make sure that, especially when you're at church, but... Don't let anybody know. You know, you just you need to make sure make them feel like you know you've got it all together and everything's great because you follow Jesus. And that was kind of the narrative that I grew up in thinking and kind of not realizing that's what was being put in my heart and my mind, but it was. And it was like, what do we do? Well, you try and to appear as perfect as you possibly can. And it's still happening today. I mean, look at social media. That's what most of it is. Most of the time it's just a facade. 
And what happens is that then leads to no one feeling the freedom to admit that they're not okay. And so when we only see perfection everywhere we go and you go to the church, especially, and you're around church people and they're always got it all together. If you are hurting, if you think that's the way they are, you feel like you're just this outsider, like there's something wrong with me because I don't feel okay, but I can't admit that I don't feel okay or that I'm not doing okay right now because everybody else has got it together. I'm going to let you on a secret. They don't have it all together. That person next to you doesn't have it all together. I don't care how much money they have. I don't care what kind of car they drive. I don't care how many kids they have. I don't care how successful they have been. I don't care how good looking they are. Whatever you want to call it. I promise you, they don't have it all together. They may fake it really, really well. But they don't have it all together. None of us do. And in that sermon, I remember opening up as a pastor and explaining that For 12 years, I'd battled with anxiety and depression. Never told anybody about it up to that point. Again, I I think this was around, I don't know, maybe 2014, something like that. And I I remember sharing that with the congregation. And and I always thought, there's no way that I can really talk about this publicly. Because as a preacher, you aren't supposed to have flaws, right? You, you, You can't have these issues, especially with anxiety and depression, because that would mean that your faith in Jesus isn't strong. You can't tell anyone because they'll think less of you. They will think you're weak. You have to be the strong one. At least that's what the enemy tells you. This is what goes on in your heart and your mind. If you're a leader of anything, you know this. You've probably felt this yourself. And so I had to battle through that. And I shared that. That was many, many years ago in that sermon. I shared that part of it. But then I was reminded that then came my cancer diagnosis last year. And those same feelings and thoughts reared their head again almost immediately. You are the pastor. You have to hold it together. You know, you've you got to just, you got to get through this. You, you, it, but I'll tell you, though, I, I want to be honest and tell you, those thoughts, those things flooded my mind and my heart. And, and it was like a, I, I, it was just, I don't know, it was like so confusing for a while, for a little while. But this time was different. <clears throat> I think it's because God took me through what he took me through before. But I learned, you know, my lesson there. And I told a whole lot of people many, many times that I wasn't okay when I was having a bad day or a week or even a month. And I admitted that there, that there have been tears and fears and difficult moments that <clears throat> by no means have Jen and I gone through what we've gone through. And it's just been easy and we're good. And God is good. No problems here. No, that's, God is good, but we're human beings and, and you struggle. And there's moments where you're not okay. And you know what I found in, by doing that is most people, at least those who really love you and those who really matter in your life, they're much more apt to rally around you and love you through something if they know that you're truly not okay. See, Satan doesn't want you to know that because that's, he doesn't want you to be healed. He wants you to stay in the dark. He wants you to feel like you're the only one. He wants you to fake it, try to fake it till you make it, right? And that's, that's not okay. That's not good. It's very dangerous. The other thing that I was reminded of during this last battle was the power of turning to Scripture. Being reminded that I was not the only believer who felt these types of feelings, man, that was very therapeutic. And I encourage every one of you, if you're going through a moment or a season right now of not being okay, this is going to sound probably like the most pastoral thing I could tell you or say to you. And please understand I'm saying it because it's truth. And that is, I promise you, you need to read your Bible. You need to get into God's word and not just the uplifting stories, but also the parts where it gets so real and raw that it makes us squirm a little bit. I would encourage you to read about Moses, one of the godliest men in the Bible. He had such a close relationship with the Lord. God used him to lead Israel through some of the most significant moments in history. Again, Moses had an incredibly intimate relationship with the Lord. In fact, let me read to you, remind you, Exodus 33, 11, It tells us this about Moses. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. It doesn't get much closer to God than that. And yet Moses went through a time when he just wanted to give up. This is Numbers chapter 11, um, 14 and 15. Moses is saying this to God. He says, I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. If this is how you're going to treat me, please go ahead and kill me. If I had found favor in your eyes and do not let me face my own ruin. 
don't know if you catch that or not, but again, such a godly man, so close to the Lord, and yet he asked God to kill him. It sounds to me that, like Moses wasn't okay. And you know what? It was, it's okay that he wasn't okay. And then there's Elijah, one of the most powerful prophets in the Bible. In 1 Kings chapter 18, we read that he goes up on the, the uh, Mount Carmel, right? He calls down fire from heaven, which how cool is that, right? Gets to call down fire from heaven in the middle of this contest against the false god. And of course he wins. You call down fire from heaven, you're always going to win. That's pretty much a, a guarantee thing, right? And he wins. And I'm going to go out on a limb here and just say that none of you have ever had that kind of success, right? And so, yeah, after this major victory, we see him at the end of his rope when he has been threatened by the queen. This is 1 Kings 19, 3 and 4. It says, Elijah was afraid. He ran for his life, and when he came to Beersheba and Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went on a day's journey into the wilderness. He goes off in the woods by himself. He came to a broom bush sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Church, if Elijah, a biblical hero, experienced such a low point, why are we surprised when we are hit by feelings like these ourselves? And these are just two. If you read your Bible, many of you have, and you know this, there are so many more examples in Scripture of men and women who had moments or seasons where they weren't okay. And of course, we see this in our text even this morning. Even the Apostle Paul needed to be encouraged. Jesus didn't show up for no reason. What I'm trying to say is it's okay to not be okay. We can admit that what we are, that we are struggling with something. No matter what it is, that is actually where the healing begins. See, something else that I've learned through the latest difficult season that I've been going through is that peace comes, a peace that allows you to move forward and overcome, even though your circumstances may not change or may not even get any better, could get worse. That peace only comes when we choose to surrender. That peace only comes when we choose to surrender. I agonize with anxiety for 12 years. I wallowed in fear for months when I first was diagnosed with cancer and I begged Jesus to change my circumstances. But you know what? He wanted to change me. He wanted me to surrender to him and trust him no matter the outcome. See, I was trying to work the deal, so to speak. And, and, and though I, I tried to fight against that, there's, there's all these things that run through your heart and your mind, and you're just kind of like, Lord, please change my circumstances. Please, uh, you know, don't allow this and allow this. And, please. and there's nothing wrong with praying those prayers of things that our heart's desires. But I had to understand that while I prayed those things, I also needed to understand that no matter the outcome, I needed to surrender to Jesus and to surrender to whatever it is he had for me. And he wants you to do the same thing in your life. Church, correct thinking leads to correct actions. The first step in winning the war against worry and anxiety and depression and fear and loneliness is surrender to God's will. It's understanding that God really is greater than whatever you're going through and that he loves you more than you could ever fathom. And whether he heals us on this side of heaven or in heaven, he is still good and he will never leave us or forsake us. And so if, you, if you're ever going to experience victory over overwhelming circumstances, you have to grasp the foundational truths that God is good, that he is perfect, that he has a plan, and that no matter what that plan is, it's what's best for you. We are to take courage and surrender to that plan. That is essentially what Jesus was telling Paul to do here in Acts 23, 11. Again, he says, the follow, that following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, take courage. Take courage. Other translations say, be of good cheer. Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. He's saying, I'm not done with you, Paul. There's still work for you to do. Take courage. Keep fighting the fight. He shows up in his prison cell, no doubt at a moment when Paul needed to hear it most, and just says, take courage. I see you, Paul. 
I see what you're going through. I've seen what you've done. I know what you're going to do. Trust me, I'm in charge. I've got this. You're going to be okay. Take courage. Paul doesn't even know how he's going to get to Rome. I mean, he's in prison right now, and I'm sure this visit from Jesus, though, filled him back up and gave him a peace that made no sense considering his circumstances. But that's what complete surrender to the Lord does. I don't know what you're going through today. I would guess in a crowd this size, there are many who aren't okay today. And I want to tell you this morning, it's okay to not be okay. It doesn't make you less of a person and less of a Christian because you're struggling with something right now. Maybe even your relationship with the Lord. You don't understand some things. Maybe you're angry even at the Lord. I can't admit that. I can't. Why wouldn't you admit that? that Healing is going to come when we begin to open up and talk about what we're going through. And I would encourage you to not hide it and to seek out someone you trust to talk about it. Listen, there's good godly counselors that you need to go to. You have not, you've not been defeated as a Christian if you have to go to someone else for help. That's, that's, that's a great idea, right? That, that's someone who is educated enough, smart enough to understand Listen, I need help. That's intelligence. And I would also encourage you to get into God's word and to surrender to the Lord. It's just super, super important that we understand this and we see this because as Christians, we are sometimes the reason that people put up walls because we don't allow them the opportunity to really share that they're not okay. Because nine times out of ten, when we go to someone and we say to them, hey, how you doing? What we really mean is we just want them to say, I'm good, and move on. We don't really mean, how you really doing, right? And so that we pick up on that. It's something that we just learn as as people, especially within the church. And we've got to get to the point where we can find someone that we can say, hey, I need to talk to you because I'm not okay. And I need some help. Satan's going to make you believe you're the only one dealing with what you're dealing with. You're wrong for feeling the way you feel. And he's going to try to ostracize you and isolate you. And that's a very dangerous place to be. I want you to remember these people in Scripture we've talked about today. And again, there's so many more. Matter of fact, I was reading this morning. um, I was looking through Instagram uh, early this morning and actually came across... uh, Kaylee posted this, and um, Kaylee Webb, I don't want you to think it's Kaylee, my daughter-in-law, but, uh, and she posted this from John Acuff, and I thought, oh my goodness, that's, that's so good. That's what we're talking about here. So I'm going to read it to you. This is, again, this is John Acuff's quote. It says, God found Gideon in a hole, found Joseph in a prison, found Daniel in a lion's den, He has a curious habit of showing up in the midst of trouble, not the absence. Where the world sees failure, God sees future. Next time you feel unqualified to be used by God, remember this. He tends to recruit from the pit, not the pedestal. I thought, man, that's so good. We need to hear that today. You're not less than because maybe you're not doing so great right now. All through Scripture, People found themselves in very difficult situations. And that's where God shows up so many times. He's in those moments. And if you've not been praying already, I would encourage you to be doing that as well. Spend time before the Lord and ask him to show up. He's a good God. He loves you. He cares about you. And I promise when you read through scripture, you're going to see that it feels a lot like Paul probably felt when Jesus himself showed up and said, take courage. You're going to read through there and you're going to feel that feeling of, God's saying, take courage, daughter. Take courage, son. I love you. You're going to be okay. We're going to get through this. It's going to remind us that this this world is is going to pass away. That's why all through Scripture, there's so many verses that talk about this world, this moment, why we're here. It's like a vapor. We're here today, gone tomorrow. It's eternity that we should be living for. And we've got to have our eyes set on that. We've got to be reminded of that. And someone today needs to hear that. Let this be your guide and understand and be okay with feeling like you're not okay. 
But I also remind you, don't stay that way. Don't just wallow in whatever it is you're in. Seek out the help you need, mainly the Lord's help. But don't let anyone tell you that somehow you're different or you're less than because you're struggling with something. They're struggling too. They may be hiding it. They're struggling or have struggled before. It's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to stay that way. 